Over you there. Yeah, our next speaker is um, David Johnson from Armadale. Um, I learnt last night apparently he's the president of the Armadale Walking Club. Um, but apart from that, he's done a lot of work with the group down there on animal genetics. Um, and uh, he's going to explain to you and me about how my definition of breeding cattle, which is like gets like, can become very complicated if you study genetics long enough. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. I'm going to send you on a bit of a whirlwind tour of genetics, so we're going to go right back to the grass level. I'm not going to talk about markets. I'm not going to talk about economics. I'm going to try and get straight into uh, the genetics and, and how Northern Territory cattlemen can use genetics in their breeding program. So I'm going to go right back to bull meets cow. So I want to talk about genetic variation, how we describe genetic variation, and most importantly, making genetic progress. And this has been the sleeper in the room for the beef industry. We haven't taken advantage of making genetic progress to increase productivity and profitability. And then I want to pose a few questions to you guys as to what do you need from genetics? And are you getting what you need? So we know we've got lots of genetic variation when we work in beef. We've got all sorts of between breed variations for, for a whole number of traits. But we also know we've got lots of genetic variation within a breed. And so you just go within the Brahmin breed. You've got big ones, tall ones, short ones. How do we describe those genetic differences? Because if we can describe them, we can use them. And so at, in the, at using genetics, and everyone at, back at their, their stations know you've got a, you can make a choice of breeds, you can then pick bulls within those breeds, and then you can choose how you use them. Do you use them in straight breeding? Do you use them in a crossbreeding system? Or do you develop composites? So you're using genetics in every time you're making those decisions. And then, obviously, genetics is only then a part of that profitability and productivity. As we know, the performance of an animal is a combination of the genetics and the environment. So here, we've got the, the weight of that steer it's a combination of the genes he inherited from his parents and the production system he's running in. Now, half comes from mum and half comes from dad, and that's set at conception, when bull meets cow, and you can't change it. Once that's set, it's set. And, and, and then the rest is simply up to you. And this is what you spend most of your time doing, providing the production system, the market, the health, the management of that animal. But this is the bit that you can also do something about. We focus a lot on this, but there's actually here, and we can estimate this with genetic tools. And that's what I want to spend the rest of the talk, is going through what we can do in terms of estimating that. And to do it, it's very simple. It requires performance recording. And simply taking records, weights, scans, scores, measuring these animals, recording the contemporary group. I'll tell you why that's important which paddock an animal is in when you measure that performance, and the pedigree. Who is mum and who is dad? That might take mothering up, or now we have the tools of DNA parentage. So what do we do with that? We put it into a genetic evaluation, and we have Australia's own system called Breed Plan. It takes those performance records, and it separates out the E bit to give you the G bit, which is called an estimated breeding value. And that's all that Breed Plan is doing when it takes those records. It requires the contemporary group because it wants to do comparisons of like with like, those animals that have had the same opportunity to perform. And it adjusts for things like age and age of dam. And now we're adding genomics into that as well. So we're doing a lot of research that we can actually use information from DNA into those estimated breeding values. And of course, EBVs, or estimated breeding values, predict differences between bulls in what we think, in what we expect their progeny to do. It doesn't predict actual. We don't know that this bull will produce 50 kilogram birth weights because we can't predict the E bit in, a, in advance, but we can predict the G bit. So if we go in, we can now have traits in breed plan for a range of traits right through to some traits now for temperament and meat quality. And so we've got also other traits in the mix, but you can see lots of traits here that are affecting 
your profitability and your productivity. What are we going to need in the future? If we go into changing production systems, new markets and meeting consumer needs, we'll be needing new traits that we should be breeding for to increase profitability. And we also have dollar EBVs. So some people would be aware that you can take all these separate trade EBVs and turn them into a single EBV for dollars. And how do we do that? We weight each of these EBVs here. We weight them all according to the market that those animals are going to be used in, the production system, and getting a balance of the steer traits and the bull traits. And what does that do? It simplifies all those estimated breeding values for all those different traits into a single EBV in dollars. And so that's what you select bulls on and there are standard cases for each of the different breeds you might be working with. So how big are these genetic differences? And I want to spend just a little bit of time going through. What, what can we expect from genetics? And it depends on the trait. Some traits are more variable than others. Some breeds have more variation than others. But the main thing that dictates how big are the genetic difference is the level of performance recording. So we've got two bulls here. As they stand in front of you, they might look reasonably similar. This bull's plus 95 EBV for 600 day weight. This bull is minus seven. That's off the Brahman website this morning. And there's a 50 kilogram difference predicted in the progeny weight of those two bulls. That's the power of genetics. If you knew that, I'm sure you could use that in your production systems. Likewise, two, two pole Hereford bulls here, both very similar for 400 day weight, but in fact differ very markedly for their, for their birth weight. Uh, up to a three kilogram difference we'd expect in the progeny for their birth weight. So very similar 400 day weight, but using EBVs we're able to show that there's a vastly different in their birth weight. Likewise, an example from Angus, uh, where we see also similar weight, almost a four kilogram expected difference in the progeny uh, of those two bulls for similar weight. Now that would have a very big impact potentially on calving difficulty. There's also traits you can't see, and this is where you really start to get the power of estimated breeding values. These two bulls vastly differ for a trait that's important in this breed called marbling. And we measure it with the intramuscular fat EBV. These are the EBVs of those two bulls. You always consider the difference between them, which is very different. They're almost a marble score difference in their progeny for marbling. You can't see that on those bulls. You can't see the genes they carry for intramuscular fat. Most importantly, how big are these differences for reproduction? Because that's one of the key profit drivers in Northern Australia and in tropical breeds. Our beef CRC, we set up a project just quickly to say we bred cattle on some large pastoral company properties across Northern Territory. We also bred Brahmins at our cooperating uh, beef CRC Northern Pastoral Group of companies and, and several of them in the room today. And then we put those females, both Brahmins and tropical composites, at Turak, Swans Lagoon, Belmont and Bryan Pastures research stations. And we generated 4,500 progeny, we used 50 Brahmin bulls and 50 tropical composites. We took the steers to 320 kg carcasses and measured absolutely everything. And we took the females to nine-year-old cows. That's the real important part of this project. So we generated a lot of families. So we, we took this bull, Newcastle Water Toby, and we generated 25 steers that we measured but equally, we, we took 25 of his daughters. We generated 25 daughters, which we took through to lifetime performance. And we had 50 of those families. And that's how we were able to do these, these studies. Here's some of the tropical composites, which was from the AA company. So some of the steers of this bull here and some of his daughters running. This is probably at, at Turak. And what did we do? We measured them using ovarian scanning. We did full mating, calving, and... Uh, weaning up to six opportunities. So we took them through to they were rising nine-year-old cows. We measured their ovarian activity every four to six weeks for their entire life. So we knew exactly what that cow was doing reproductively on 2,200 cows for nearly 10 years. And what did we find? Very quick snapshot, age at puberty. We see that there was a, a three to four months difference between the age at puberty of the daughters of this bull compared to this bull. So I'm just going to give you a snapshot. There's millions of results I could give. Uh, here's lactation and oestrus interval. So we know in the Brahmins, their, their ability to cycle whilst lactating 
Well, it has a big genetic component. And we see here that some bulls were four months difference in how long it took them to start cycling after calving compared to the daughters of other bulls. Here's a particular example. And these animals, these cows are treated alike. They're under exactly identical conditions. And in this case, there was a 40% difference in calving rate of the daughters of this bull compared to the daughters of this bull uh, in their first lactation or their first rebreed. In terms of lifetime calving rate, in the CRC, there was a 16%, there was a 13% difference in the annual calving rate of the daughters of those bulls. These bulls here compared to these bulls here. Every year their daughters were producing 13% more calves over those six years. And it doesn't take much economics to work out how much more those cows were generating. If we go into something like the Santa Gertrudis, there's a days to calving EBV, which is the female reproduction EBV. You can see minus 15 days to plus 26. Lots of genetic variation within these breeds, if we can only measure it and capture it. And it's actually reflected quite well in those dollar indexes, which is the profitability index. Likewise, in the Brahmins, again, minus 20 to plus 18 days spread in the EBV. So all I want to demonstrate here is there's lots of genetic variation within these breeds for reproduction. So, next part of the talk. We can describe the genetic variation. What if we could then use it to increase profitability and productivity? And the key is using estimated breeding values to make genetic progress. How fast we go depends on how well we record, the accuracy, how intensely we record, and the generation interval, how long it takes us to do these things. And in all cases, in beef production, selecting bulls is the key. That's where we'll get most of our gain from, is when you make bull selections. Why use EBVs? It separates that G from E. If you just look at the animal itself, then you're not able to tell how much is G, genetics, or how much is E, environment. How much is feed contributing to the performance? But the EBV allows that to be separated, it allows comparisons across groups, across herds, and across years. And that's where the power comes if you can use those. It allows you to select for a balance of traits, predictable, permanent, and cumulative change. And that's where you can also get the benefit. Year after year, those benefits add up. And it allows you to ca calculate genetic trends, how you're actually improving it by taking the mean EBV of each year drop. And I'll show you just a couple of graphs. So how does this work? If we measure any trait in any population, you'll get a bell-shaped curve. Some very good ones, some very bad ones, and then the average. If we select these animals to be the parents of the next generation, and we use the scalpel on the rest, then we move this population here, and how far we move the mean is genetic progress, just a shift in the mean. By selecting these animals, we move a population. And you can then select again and again and again and move the mean of that population, and that's the key. So here's an example from the dairy industry. This is milk production over from 1981 to 2011, but you can see the number of cows in blue has almost halved. So there's an efficiency gain through selection. Likewise, the poor old humble chook, uh, you can select, this is two selection lines where they selected for for the weight of the chicken at 56 days. They took a down line and an up line, and after 41 generations, they were able to generate a 300% difference, simply by selection. And that looks like that when you turn it into the chicken, that they had semen available from 1957 and 2000 and generated them under identical conditions, and that's the difference we now have in the meat production of the, the, the broiler. What about beef cattle? Yes, we've shown the same thing, the Angus Trangy selection lines. Again, simply selecting for growth, high line, low line, they were able to show a, a considerable change after a couple of generations of selection. In the Angus, we can take their genetic trend for their dollar EBV, and I can tell you Angus are improving at $3.80 per cow joined per year. Some herds, the top herds here, are actually off the graph at $125 average EBV. But what's happened in that 10-year period 
is Angus of increased growth by 25 kilos whilst maintaining birth weight relatively stable. They've increased marbling, increased dimuscularia, kept fat the same, reduced days to calving, which is increased fertility and increased scrotal. So that's what's contributed to that dollar gain. So they're making real progress. And in fact, if you look at a 1988 Angus, that's the spread in the bulls, that's the 2008. And the most significant thing here is the very best bull from 20 years ago is now a breed average Angus. That's how far they've shifted their population through selection. And that's the power of using selection. You can change the population. Our tropical breeds are only going at about a dollar improvement per year, mainly for growth. What we've got to do is do more recording of reproduction to lift that, that amount of change. Just a few more examples. This is an individual herd that this is the breed average for birth weight and the red line here is what that herd's doing. So what are they able to do? They're moderating birth weight whilst maintaining breed average increase in growth. How are they doing that? They're recording birth weight and selecting on birth weight EBVs whilst selecting for growth. And in this particular herd, the breed average is going at $2.40. This particular herd is improving at $7.50 per cow joined. So they're really putting the accelerator down. Limousins, another example where you can record traits that are important to you. Started recording docility and started selecting with an EBV and they've made significant change in selection for improved docility in that breed. We have examples from the Northern Territory uh, where we see from, from the work that's done at Douglas Daly that able to select on days to calving in that Brahmin herd and make significant change. And the selection started here using that EBV. And as a result, we see that the heifer pregnancy rates in the selected line compared to the commercial line, on average, have improved by 35%. So simply using those EBVs translates into better heifer pregnancy and 31% greater, percent greater reconception in wets. So clearly a big change in reproduction by focusing that selection on the days to calving EBV. So I'm close to finishing, Mr Chairman. What I, what I want to pose to the audience now is, are you getting what you need? Because most of the bulls that come into the Northern Territory are purchased from outside. There's not a lot of seed stock production. So if you're going outside looking for bulls, have you been getting what you need? If, if, if we see those genetic differences, and more importantly, what are you going to need from genetics in the next 10 years? And what signals are you actually in your purchasing decisions providing back to the seed stock breeders? Are you demanding certain genetics that perform and therefore they're providing it? Or are you just buying the biggest, fattest bulls and so that's what they provide? So it's important you have a role in what happens. If we need increased reproduction, then we need to be giving those signals back through the market so that our seed stock breeders then start recording more reproduction. And I suppose if, if this is the case, do you know where to get it? If you want genetics that do a certain job, temperament, growth rate, weaning rate, etc., uh, do you know where to go to get it? And it's important that we also understand what do you need from genetic evaluation in the, in the territory? What genetics R&D? What are the traits that are important to you? What are the limitations? So, I'm going to be here for the rest of the conference uh, tonight. So interested if anyone sort of says this is where the limitations are, uh, I'd be glad to uh, take that back. So just to finish up, I use this slide from the Beef CRC. How do we get more of these? Now, they're pretty unimpressive looking cows, but they're both 12 year old. They both went through the Beef CRC project. And what I can tell you is that the reason I think we need more of these is they're both 10 out of 10. The 10, 10 calves weaned from, uh, actually that's the 10th pregnancy, so the nine calves weaned and pregnant. Never missed a calf. And you know, that, to me, uh, under certain production systems, would be what people would demand. That, you know, that, that those cows exist. People tell me that this in the Brahmins doesn't exist. We, we had lots of them. That they are able to calve every year uh, without, without any trouble, whilst 
some of their mates couldn't do the job. And in fact, I've got this slide here, which I use quite a bit. Here's group one cows and here's group two cows. Now, the tall ones, skinny ones, fat ones, they're a bit all over the place, but there's a fundamental difference between those two groups of cows. The group of cows here, calved every second year, three from six. Under identical conditions, these cows were six from six in the project. Six calves weaned from six matings. So how do we get that? And it's very simple. Record reproduction. That's what you've got to do if you want. And, and I'm not saying necessarily you want this side. There might be some production systems, in fact, where you only want them to carve every second year. But having the EBV is the knowledge, and that's where the power comes from, is actually having that. And the other thing is you can record it, but you can select. We can improve those cows. Now, whilst these cows were six from six, that was from a three, four months joining. You might want to be able to say, I want to actually shorten the joining up and have cows that carve even shorter joining periods under your production system, and therefore you can put even more pressure. So even with a cow calving every year, you might be able to change things even greater. So just to finish, genetic differences are huge in our beef industry. I think we've tended to ignore some of those differences, but now we can clearly show there are big genetic differences for reproduction. And all we have to do is record them to describe it. We're getting additional tools now through DNA, but without the records, we can't make the DNA work anyway. So it's a, it's a bit of a catch-22. In able to use genomics, we first need the records. And then the key is we have to improve these traits through selection. That's the bit we've been missing in the beef industry compared to our competitor proteins, that we're not driving progress and moving these cattle to be more profitable and even for the markets that are important for the Northern Territory, through genetic improvement, you can be increasing productivity and profitability. Unless we're moving at more than 1 or 2% per year, which you can do with genetics, we're not beating that cost price squeeze. We're not keeping ahead of increased costs. So genetics is one way that you've got to be, even if you've got the most perfect genetics this year, if you use them again, next year you're already 1 or 2% less, profit less profitable. So even if you think you've got the ideal genetics, you need to be improving them, and genetics is one of the ways you can do that. And, of course, you've got to match the genetics to your production system. There's not one shoe fits all, and with EBVs, you're able to find the bull that fits your production system, which might be completely unsuitable to someone else. And you've got to match that. I, there's no magic formula as to what that will be. It, it's very much dependent on your management and your production system. Thank you.